again, it's a, it's a silly nitpick. Our viewers love nitpicks, so keep them coming. <laughs> Hello everyone and welcome to the latest episode of Real History and we have a real treat lined up for you today because once more I am joined by New York Times best-selling author Jeff Shera. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us Thank again. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. All right. So for this episode we are going to be taking a look at a movie that a lot of our viewers have been asking for mm -hmm. and it's very timely with the release of your latest <laughs> book and so we thought it's a good time to bring Jeff back on. The movie is the 1997 TNT film entitled Rough Riders, starring Tom Berenger. Now, uh, a few months ago you were on our channel and you were talking about uh, history and Hollywood and writing and how all of these things <laughs> uh, intertwine. Uh, so it's a good opportunity right now for you to tell us about your latest book. Oh, okay. Well, uh, The Old Lion, I have, the, I have the copy number one right here. The publisher, I was in New York last week, and they handed me the first copy of the book. Uh, the book actually is to be released May 16th, and uh, it'll be released all over the country. But this is the first one, and I'm really happy about this. It's a, a novel of the life of Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but very timely, as you say, with this film. Uh, it, it's a book told, a story told from Roosevelt's own perspective, from his own point of view late in his life, covering some of the high points. This book covers a lot more of Roosevelt's life than this film does. The fil this film is strictly based on Spanish-American War, uh, where what I've done here, this covers anywhere back from his childhood all the way to the end of his life, uh, when he passes away in, in 1919. So it's... Um, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of this. Uh, this was this was a lot of effort and a lot of research went into this, and I hope it's a book that people enjoy reading. Excellent, and we will have the link where you can buy the book in the caption below. And so please make sure you check that out. So you know, as I was uh, driving over here today, I was thinking about this movie, and I thought in an odd sort of way, your dad is also responsible for the making of this movie. <laughs> I hadn't thought of that, but you're right. Yeah. Because yeah. Tom Berenger, the actor who plays Teddy Roosevelt, he really enjoyed being in the movie Gettysburg. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to do a follow-up historical epic. And he had long been right. an admirer of Theodore Roosevelt. He made the pitch to TNT. And so I think we could say without the Killer Angels, there's no Gettysburg. <laughs> Without no Gettysburg, there's no Rough Riders. I like that. I, so, hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't really thought of that, but I, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> it, 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 that's how the, the lineage works, I think. And mm -hmm. when you look at the cast, it's pretty much a reunion of Tombstone mm -hmm. and Gettysburg actors. Right. Uh, you have Tom Berenger. You have a whole bunch of great character actors like uh, Mark Moses, Buck Taylor, mm -hmm. Pat Fauci. Patrick Gorman makes a cameo in mm -hmm. this film. Uh, Sam Elliott, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of crossover <laughs> between all these films. And so maybe they thought, why fix it if it ain't broke? Well, I think they had fun doing Gettysburg, and uh, I think they just wanted to, more of the same. Mm -hmm. They wanted to, you know, have another project that w was as entertaining to film, uh, hopefully, as it is to watch. Mm-hmm. Well mm -hmm. said. Well, let's go ahead and dive right in and take a look at Rough Riders from 1997. The time has arrived for this great nation of ours to step out upon the world stage. So let the spotlight fall on us. So Roosevelt's opening speech here, mm -hmm. uh, it takes place at the Naval War College. And what he's essentially talking about here is that the British Empire is in decline and America has a responsibility of filling the void right. uh, for empire. Uh, so in all your research about the book, how did you explore Roosevelt's sentiments on America's rising influence at the turn of the century? Well, Roosevelt very definitely felt, uh, was a great believer in the Monroe Doctrine. Um, I mean, people outside of this 
continent outside of this hemisphere need to stay out. Uh, so the, the idea of colonialism, particularly the Spanish, uh, who is the, really the Spanish were the largest colonial power in the Western Hemisphere uh, up until 1900. And of course, you've got the, the Spanish-American War comes about as a, as a result. And Roosevelt in some ways is responsible for starting that war. And I, no, I don't want to get too carried away with that. But uh, he, he recognizes that what, what the Spanish are doing to the Cubans, the Spanish occupy Cuba, it's a, Cuba is a Spanish territory, and they are brutal to the Cuban people. And I think Roosevelt is, is using that as sort of a, a flashpoint to say, look, you know, we need to get the Spanish out of here. We need to get them out of the Western Hemisphere. Look what they're doing to Cuba. We need to step up. And, you know, you have William McKinley, who's the president of the United States, and McKinley is not a forceful man in, the, in that he's not going to take a big step like this on his own. He's very cautious. The people around him, Secretary of the Navy, the Secretary of, of War, uh, they're all very cautious people. Nobody wants to just rush right in and start a war with Spain except Roosevelt. And at this point, he's the assistant secretary of the Navy. Whenever the secretary, who's an aging man, uh, goes out for, a, takes a couple of days off, Roosevelt seizes the horns and he starts issuing all kinds of paper out of the, the Naval Department uh, and you know, people hop to, and of course the Navy loves it because they get to, you know, they're, they're buying ammunition and they're, condition, they're commissioning new warships and they're doing all this stuff that normally drags on and takes forever, but Roosevelt is responsible for that. So the, the Navy and, and the, the troops in the field love him for that, which is something that comes, you know, comes to his great benefit later on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Roosevelt belongs to a group of elites known as the Metropolitan Club and the likes of Henry Cabot Lodge and Alfred Thayer Mahan, who believe that the United States should exert their growing influence. Mm -hmm. And they put that influence to good effect. This movie was directed by John Milius, who's mm -hmm. a very iconic oh, yeah. film writer and screenwriter. Yeah, he was involved in optioning my um, Shiloh book briefly. It, 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 nothing came, came oh, of it. Oh, that's it. I didn't yeah. know that. That's fascinating. Yeah. Nothing, wow. nothing came of it, but he was one of the actors and uh, one of the, the players involved in that. Oh, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Famously wrote The Wind and the Lion and directed it as well, which mm -hmm. was another Teddy Roosevelt film. Posse. Posse? The hell you say? They head this way? Damn right, they head this way. Man, can you get decent meal without interference? The movie makes it look like Roosevelt recruited, you know, anybody he could get from the old west, you know, cowboys and bushwhackers and Indian fighters and you know, and, you know, all all of that um, to be in in his regiment. Um, in fact, he was uh, astounded by the number of people who wrote in applying for service under him uh, once it was learned that he was going to be the second in command of a, of a regiment. Uh, and by the way, nobody really cared that he was second in command. They assumed, everybody assumed he was in command. It was Leonard Wood was the commanding colonel. Uh, but people wanted to be a part of Roosevelt's uh, you know, regiment. It was not called Rough Riders. Uh, People were giving names to this all over the place. Rough Roosevelt's Rough Scorpions, and I mean, just crazy <laughs> names like this. Uh, and people were saying, "I want to be a part. I want to be a part." And it just so happens that people from all over the West, um, you know, and again, United States marshals, sheriffs, um, outlaws, Indians, Indian hunters, um, hunters, ranchmen, cattlemen, uh, just swarmed uh, to uh, Roosevelt's position when he was at the Naval Department uh, asking to be a part of this. And Roosevelt didn't have to go out and recruit anybody. They recruited themselves. <laughs> I'll have Father make a commemorative bowl out of silver and it will have our names inscribed on the side. Hold their manhoods cheap while any speak that fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. It's a lot of Victorian bravado uh, <laughs> in this uh, movie. <laughs> but there's a degree of reality to that because as some of the characters acknowledge, it had been 30 years since a major war. You have mm -hmm. the sons of Civil War veterans looking to inherit their share of the glory as <laughs> right. they perceive it. 
And uh, the Civil War plays largely in the mm -hmm. forces motivating and shaping the characters throughout this movie, as we'll be finding out. Yeah. Whoa. They still back there? You see them? How come their horses ain't played out? Come on, let's cut over to Sidewinder. The subplot with the supposed outlaw Henry Nash is one of the more exaggerated <laughs> features of this movie. And uh, it's thought that uh, director John Milius uh, merged this guy's experiences with those of another outlaw mm -hmm. who the lawman Bucky O'Neill was chasing. Uh, but Nash in reality was uh, a teacher and a very civic-minded individual, <laughs> and he's made to be a, a rogue outlaw uh, in this movie. Edith, hmm? let's get to the point. Let's not pretend. You've made no mention of it. Of what? As we're further introduced to Theodore Roosevelt here, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps you can tell us a little bit more about some of your interactions with the actor who played him, uh, Tom Berenger, <laughs> who plays James Longstreet, of course, in Gettysburg. Well, I had dinner with him once, uh, and, uh, with an actually ex-wife, and uh, actually Martin Sheen was there, and with his wife as well, and um, a number of the Confederates from the film. We had dinner at, uh, at the, the Fairfield Inn, as a matter of fact, uh, which has changed hands a couple of times. It seems like everything has changed hands a couple of times <laughs> since then. But uh, no, I mean, a very nice guy. He, again, he was extremely enthusiastic about being in the film Gettysburg. He loved playing Longstreet. Um, and I think it shows in the performance. You're a force of nature. That's what you wanted to know, isn't it? Edith Roosevelt's, of course, a very strong woman, and she mm -hmm. very much fulfills this idea of the responsibilities of a first lady that we now associate with right. the obligations of a first lady. Uh, to what extent does she play a role in your book? Oh, she's all over the place. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, she's a, she's a powerful figure. She's an important character. Uh, she's certainly important to him. Uh, she puts up with him, and, and there's a wonderful quote that I use that she says, you know, you, you, you only have to put up with me, or I have to put up with you. And uh, that, that applies to their marriage very much. <laughs> that she, you know, she is a, a great character. Mm -hmm. We got here just on time. Up there is Bucky O'Neill, sheriff of Yavapai County. Hell, he's killed over 35 men. Bucky O'Neill was this rather adventurous and colorful <laughs> individual of the Old West. He was a gambler, he was a speculator, he was a politician, dabbled in a little bit of everything, uh, settled a little bit of land off the edge of the Grand Canyon. I believe uh, the cabin that he mm -hmm. resided in is still part of the park there right. today. Uh, appropriately enough, uh, he lived in Tombstone, Arizona for a first time, where perhaps he encountered his other cinematic equivalent of <laughs> right. Virgil Earp, played right. by Sam Elliott in Tombstone. Right. Yeah, he was also extremely well read. Um, I mean, a very, a very esoteric uh, reading material, and he impressed Roosevelt with that. He could quote things that Roosevelt had never heard of, mm. which was unusual, because Roosevelt had read a great deal as well. That's fascinating. I don't know anything about commanding a regiment. I don't even know to whom to salute. Superior officers would be a good start. I have no idea of supply or organization. I can learn I'm a quick study, but this whole thing could be over while we're stumbling around. How do you reflect upon the partnership of Roosevelt and Leonard Wood? It's not really like it's portrayed here. They were good friends um, long before, and Roosevelt has a great deal of respect for Wood. Um, Wood was chosen to be commander of this regiment, the, the first volunteer regiment of cavalry, uh, and, and Roosevelt was immediately picked by the president to be his second in command. The film makes it l a little bit like there's a lot of recruiting going on mm -hmm. here, and that Roosevelt is, is un very unsure of himself. I don't think that was ever the case. Mm -hmm. Why not at the head of the wildest madcap regiment since the Mongols rode the steps? Theodore. Do you know that you're mad? And Leonard Wood is, of course, uh, played by another great character actor who ends up in Hollywood as an actor mm -hmm. somewhat by accident. That's military advisor Dale Dye, who can mm -hmm. be seen in Saving Private Ryan, Band of Brothers, and a lot of other films that we've taken a look at here on Real History. Well, if it were up to me, I would drive every European flag from the continent by bayonet point. 
we'd be fighting half the world if you were president. The president has the backbone of a chocolate eclair. <laughs> That's an actual quote. Uh huh, mm -hmm. the chocolate eclair. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a lot older now than I was in the Civil War. Oh, but you are spry, General. Very spry. We could use someone from the South to participate at a very high level of command. There's a lot to unpack here in this scene because we have three <laughs> very notable figures, all who participated in the Civil War. John Hay, mm -hmm. who served in Lincoln's mm -hmm. White House. We have General Wheeler, uh, this uh, excellent cavalry commander from the Confederacy who fought in many Civil War battles you've written about yes. in your books. Yes. And then we have President McKinley, who was in the 23rd Ohio mm -hmm. who fought at Antietam. It was McKinley's experiences during the Civil War it was one of the reasons that compelled him to be so reluctant to get into conflict with Oh, Spain absolutely. Man, he actually tells Roosevelt that at one point, I've seen war. You know, don't be in a hurry. Um, it's, it may not be what you expect. A naval blockade is in the offing, gentlemen. A naval blockade is hardly a war. Furnish the pictures, Freddy, and I'll furnish the war. Oh, here we have George Hamilton playing William Randolph Hearst, mm -hmm. telling Frederick Remington this apocryphal quote, <laughs> you produce the images, I'll produce the war. There's no record of him saying that, but right, no. perhaps the sentiment is true though. <laughs> right. And considering the scale of this production, I think of all of the other historical films that TNT was producing in the 1990s, it was kind of this golden age mm -hmm. for history movies. Right. When I was coming of age and I was watching all of these things, and little wonder I took the career path that I did. There was this sort of zeitgeist there, you know, and a lot mm -hmm. of it was um, riding on the hills of Gettysburg, as, as we right. mentioned earlier. Right. Well, and had glory as well. I mean, there were the big epic historical films mm -hmm. um, that, you know, definitely, I think, drew a lot of people into the entire subject matter. All right, well, I'll sign us all in. Mm. Wadsworth. I'll take the bag for you. Thank you, Robert. Wadsworth, isn't it? Yes, correct. To what extent was there a culture shock, do you think, between these different segments of uh, the Rough Riders? Oh, I think quite a bit. I mean, you, uh, you had, as I said before, you had Indian fighters coming from the far west. You had uh, you know, buffalo hunters. You had uh, ranchers, cattle ranchers coming from the Dakotas, uh, from Colorado, from Texas. And then you had, you know, big city dudes. I mean, these guys coming down from New York and, you know, people from Princeton University or, or Harvard University coming down, uh, all of whom were there because they wanted to serve under Roosevelt. Um, and even though most of them had never met him, they had heard of him and they, they liked the reputation. His reputation had sort of exploded by that by that point, by being the cattle rancher himself in the Dakotas. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think when these fellows started to mix with each other, um, it was a challenge mm -hmm. <laughs> getting the training mm -hmm. done. But as you mentioned, uh, Roosevelt is in many ways a perfect character to bring them together because he considers himself both an Easterner and a Westerner. Uh, he's all of the above, yeah, definitely. And, yeah. And, 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 you know, and it's a, like put up or shut up. I mean, he has been a, a cattleman in the Dakotas for a couple of years. He spent out there and he was a pretty serious business out there. Uh, I, I go into, in my book, I go into a lot of the things that he accomplished out there, some of his adventures, which were pretty mm -hmm. Extraordinary, um, and then of course he's a you know he's a Harvard-educated Easterner, um, and so he does cross all the boundaries, mm -hmm. and I think that makes all the difference in the world. Roosevelt certainly intended to look the part. He went to Brooks Brothers, I believe, to get <laughs> his tailored <laughs> uniforms. It brought a dozen pair of spectacles with him. Uh, this is a man raring for a fight. Yeah, he, um, he, he, officers were required to buy their own clothing. I had my tailor at Brooks Brothers make this uniform for me. What do you think? And so that, of course, being who he is, he goes, as you say, to Brooks Brothers in New York and gets suited out in his, in his garb uh, to match, match what his men are supposed to be wearing as well. Well, I think it's... Splendid! I had one prepared for you as well. This, this is bully. Part of Roosevelt's inspiration to service also has to do in part with the actions or rather the inactions of his father. 
during the Civil War. Maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Well, his father doesn't serve in the war, but his father had enormous other pluses uh, as a, a man who gave away, he, I mean, he, what he founded in New York City for uh, destitute children. Mm. Uh, he founded the Children's Aid Society in New mm -hmm. York. Um, I mean, he was a philanthropist of the first order. And, uh, and Roosevelt, you know, very much respected his father. In fact, um, his father was, probably the leading figure in his life right and his father dies when Roosevelt is very young college age and um, that loss affects Roosevelt I think for the rest of his life attention troop <coughs> <coughs> This part with him coughing and barking mm -hmm. orders, it's a little bit of acknowledgement of well, how sickly of a child. Yeah, asthma. Was. I mean, he suffered mightily from asthma as, as a child. By the time he got to college, it, it would still hit him every now and then. Uh, by this time, by the, the, the 18, late 1898s, uh, he was pretty much over mm -hmm. it. Yeah. You know. Crane. Stephen Crane, aren't you? Yes, and you, sir. I know you don't prefer to go by the title of novelist, but we have a very famous <laughs> novelist depicted in this film in the form of uh, Stephen Crane. Stephen Crane, yep. So, of course, the author of The Red Badge of Courage, which comes out just a, a few years prior to all of this. And Crane probably had a death wish of sorts. You know, he was suffering from tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. it passes away a short time after the war, and he just adds to the, the hodgepodge of wildly colorful individuals who are already sure. in this I movie. Sure, I mean, you've got, you've got you know, cameo appearances by all kinds of people, most of which are real people, mm -hmm. uh, which is one, a helpful thing when you're watching this movie is it's not just a bunch of made-up characters. Well, one thing I noticed right away, and this is the, the restriction of Hollywood, uh, there were approximately a thousand Rough Riders. There mm -hmm. were a thousand men in the, the first volunteer uh, art, uh, cavalry, uh, and the film doesn't really show that by any stretch. And uh, again, it's not the fault necessarily of the film, it's just the, the, mm -hmm. the limitations of, of what, their budget. Yeah. <laughs> it is a TV movie after all. Right. Yeah. Colonel, what do you think of these men, these so-called Rough Riders. I think the first United States Volunteer Cavalry could whip Caesar's 10th Legion. I think these men could ride with Genghis Khan. <laughs> Perhaps you can uh, explain a little bit uh, some of Roosevelt's PR savvy uh, as all of this was unfolding. Well, the film portrays him sort of as front and center as the spokesman mm -hmm. to the press uh, for the regiment. Uh, he, if anything, he was very uncomfortable having all the attention focused on him. Mm. I mean, this was uh, Leonard Wood's regiment. Mm -hmm. Leonard Wood was in command, and Roosevelt, from the very beginning, he was uncomfortable when, and even the troops themselves, treated him as though he was the commanding officer. Mm. Uh, so I, I, th I think the film may have a little exaggerated as he's speaking to the press there. Uh, I don't think he quite... Uh, would t take the bull by the horns that way. And if we get these people to Tampa right now, they're going to start shooting each other. I sort of don't think uh, Leonard Wood would have tolerated shenanigans like that as they no. were waiting for. No, trains. I don't think it's yeah. it's, in the, it's in the historical record that they had that kind of a celebration when they went off when uh -huh. they finally got on the trains. Uh huh. I like that little brief moment of poignancy when they're passing the old Confederate soldiers, uh, you know, missing a limb. Um, the train, in fact, went from San Antonio to, to Tampa, Florida. Mm -hmm. So where you're passing through is the heart of the Confederacy. Um, and so you would see, and, and a lot of these troops, particularly the, the people from far out west or from New York, um, they're passing through country they've never seen. But they've, they've never seen Spanish moss before. Mm. They've never seen swamps like you pass through in you know, Mississippi, Alabama. Um, and it's, it's, it's an interesting culture shock for the troops, mm. but it's also interesting for the people watching them go by, because uh -huh. these, for, for the most part, are citizens of the Deep South. Uh-huh. 
And then fittingly at the very end of that sequence, we have Patrick Gorman playing an old Confederate officer <laughs> evoking the ghost of John Bell Hood, perhaps. Right. <laughs> 10,000 men could take place in 48 hours. How would he know that? <laughs> exactly, General. By God, how would he? But once the troops arrived in Tampa, some of them were rather smitten with the nice environs of it. You know, the officers stayed at the Tampa Hotel. This is kind of the honeymoon period of their war. Uh, the officers were living in essentially a resort hotel. It was a nice place for the end of a rail line, right. um, all things considered. But then the waiting game started. Right. Well, they were also thrown in amongst the rest of the army, um, so they weren't quite the, uh, the, the the tourist attraction they had been in San Antonio, mm -hmm. uh, because they were surrounded by literally thousands of other troops, regular army troops, regular cavalry troops, um, all of them assembled in this one place in Tampa uh, to make ready to go join the war. I am a U.S. congressman. I'm here on personal request by the President of the United States. And I'm a reb. I understand. Listen to me very closely. I have got these Yankees. <laughs> Gary Busey has uh, the perfect level of eccentricity, I think, for uh, <laughs> uh, General Wheeler amidst all this. By God, I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. That's because nothing like this has ever happened in your lifetime. The sentiments conveyed in this conversation are very true because indeed the 10th Cavalry was the most combat experienced of units mm -hmm. that were corralling here having right. fought on the, the plains and in the desert for many many years in the, the Indian Wars. Blackjack Pershing, he figures into another one of your uh, books as well. Which is where he gets the name Blackjack uh -huh. because he commanded the Buffalo Soldiers. Let's turn to our room. Now we'll make it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll you. I'm so fit, I'll beat you up so thirsty. Is there any account of how Edith felt about her husband leaving? Uh, I think, she, and I, I put a little bit of this in, in my book, that she, I mean, there was no way she was ever going to stop him. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, this was something he was destined to do, and he had talked about it for quite a, you know, quite a long time. Uh, the fact that, one, the movie doesn't really bring this out, but very few women, I mean, the officers, as you say, were at the, the Tampa Hotel, which today is the University of Tampa, mm -hmm. in downtown Tampa. Um, and a, a number of officers, a very small number, brought their wives in and as did Roosevelt but not many and it was sort of a because he was not a senior officer he was a junior commander uh, second in command and it was sort of uh, a little untoward that he would bring his wife to, into that situation mm -hmm. you're on transport with the 71st New York there's only room for one regiment and it better be yours we will be mounted no no what you ain't taking any horses, you're dismounted cavalry. No horses, General but Wheeler. But we trained as cavalry! <laughs> this thing gets to the heart of the logistical hurdles that the U.S. <laughs> Army had to confront. They're, of course, informed that they can't take their horses despite the fact that they've trained as cavalry. Right. And it's one heck of a mess when they get to the ships. These aren't traditional troop transport ships. They're essentially glorified cargo ships that they're... Right shoving men into mm -hmm. and it's just one fiasco after the next getting from florida to cuba the expeditionary forces landed well it says here there was no losses it was a circus as far as i can tell if one company of spaniards had opposed them they'd all be dead actor brian keith had played roosevelt himself in john millius's the wind and the lion mm -hmm. which is uh a fantastically entertaining yet highly exaggerated <laughs> account of the Moroccan <laughs> crisis. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he does a great job of playing Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and he plays his predecessor here. Unfortunately, actor Brian Keith was uh, suffering from cancer as they were mm -hmm. filming this movie, and tragically enough, he, he took his own life a month before this movie aired on television. This was yeah. the, the last movie he was ever in. Can any of you tell me where those Spanish bastards are? I can. Well, then speak up. I can show you where all the bastards are. But you'll get us some food, okay? You want to see some Spaniards, you say? That's why I'm here. Can't you get us some food or what? Oh, my God. There was certainly some friction between U.S. troops and the Cuban freedom fighters. Uh, many of the Cubans were were black, their skin was black, and there was racial animus between they and U.S. troops. So. 
they often got along to get along, but it wasn't always smooth sailing. And it, well, they really were not a partnership. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cubans really did not hold up their end when it came to fighting, even though they they talked a good game and they, they were thrilled the Americans were there to help throw the Spanish out. But at the end of the day, the Cubans were not very good fighters. Mm -hmm. And they didn't put that many men into the field that really helped, particularly Roosevelt's group, uh, to help the Rough Riders. Uh, they got very little help from the Cubans. Cuba Libre. Oh, yes, you're mine, and I love you best of all. When you must be my woman, or I'll have no woman at all. There'll be a hot time, Santiago, tonight. I believe this was the official song of the 1st Cavalry. <laughs> yeah. uh, relatively new hit. I think it came mm -hmm. out in 1895, so it's only about three years old. It's certainly a, a good tune to step your march to. Mm -hmm. Alan. Sir. Reconnoiter forward. Very well, sir. Sergeant Fish. Yes, sir. Give me four of your men. I'll take point. As we're on the eve of Roosevelt's first taste of battle here. What, what were his expectations of battle? Were they realistic as he was heading into harm's way? I think he was terrified. I mean, I, I think every man around him was terrified because they, none of them had ever been in that exact situation. Plus, if you look at the, the jungle, um, you can't see anything. So you don't know how close the enemy could be. They could be 20 feet away from you or they could be 200 yards and you can't see a thing. And then when the bullets start flying through those leaves, start flying through the trees and clipping the leaves, um, you still can't see where they're coming from. So it's, it's a terrifying, anybody who says they're not scared in this situation is just flat out lying. And I think Roosevelt, he, he felt the anxiety, the anxiety of it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he recognized his responsibility. And he was, you know, so he leads his men into this horrible situation where they can't see anything. Um, and he, he's, he's on the front, right out there with them. The journalist Edward Marshall was uh, a real reporter. He's put into some of these situations where another reporter by the name of Richard Harding Davis mm -hmm. was actually following Roosevelt right. around a lot. And Davis is a real fanboy of Roosevelt yes. uh, and helped to perpetuate the Rough Rider legend. Yeah, there are a couple of scenes that I put in, in my own book uh, with Davis um, as they're in the midst of the fight because he actually performs. He actually does some things right. that, that are, are very useful for Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. He spots the enemy and takes right. a few pot shots himself. So, right. yeah, not necessarily a non-combatant. No. <laughs> Now, one thing that I would say right now is, is in this combat is it, this is all a close order. The fighting at La Guasimas, which is where this is taking place, was not close order at all. The Spanish were at a good distance away mm -hmm. and had the smokeless powder. And so they could, you know, they were picking out targets and not revealing their own, their own location. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas the Americans simply couldn't, had no idea where the shots were coming from. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of Hollywood in, in this scene. Mm -hmm. They do walk straight into an ambush though, right. which is captured here. Right. Ah, ah. Oh, it got the both of us. Badly wounded. Hamilton Fish was one of these real-life New Yorkers mm -hmm. who was uh, killed here at Las Guasimas. Right. Uh, as you suggested, they even even if they exaggerate ever so slightly here and there, most of the characters are real. Yeah, and I do like one thing that they got right, which is that when you see the Americans, whenever you see the Rough Riders shooting, there's smoke. Mm -hmm. When you see the Spanish shooting, there's no smoke. Mm. That, was, that was the problem for the Americans, was picking the Spanish out of, of their hiding places. Mm -hmm. It's a good production note. Mm -hmm. All right, sir. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm okay. Ah. I haven't had a horse shot out from under me in 30 years. <laughs> It's still a thrill. And of course, General Wheeler, on several occasions throughout the fighting, essentially says, yeah, we have the Yankees on the run again. Yes, you know, exactly. It's like, <laughs> this flashback from 30 years earlier. Yeah, and even Roosevelt points that out in, in his sort of inner monologue that I, when I write about it, is, he, as he says, he's wondering if, if Wheeler doesn't actually think we're chasing Yankees <laughs> rather than the Spaniards. Theodore! Colonel! I can see that. 
What did Roosevelt recall of these opening shots of his military career? Well, I mean, it was the most exciting time of his life. Um, you know, he, he, uh, he loved it in, in hindsight. Mm. I mean, at the time it was going on, I mean, one of the problems he has uh, that I, I put in my book was his, uh, he hates looking at the bodies of the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, when they have the sort of service after the Battle of Guasimas, um, and he's looking at the six or eight you know, dead soldiers on the ground. He doesn't want to look at the faces. Mm. Uh, he he, just, he he's not comfortable with that. He's not comfortable with a funeral service. Um, he's not especially religious, which is something maybe a lot of people don't realize. So he doesn't take the the sort of religious funeral service where mm. they're singing Amazing Grace and all of that. Um, he doesn't fall into that. Uh, he he sort of detaches himself from it. So I think he detaches himself from the horror. Um, even though he's you know totally invested in the adventure of it. Spanish rifles don't make any smoke, so they're hard to find, but we are finding them, we are killing them, we are advancing. Hey, you get your blue belly in that up off that goddamn beach and tie into the right and turn the flake on these bastards, then we'll get the fox back in the hen house. They had landed at Daiquiri, which was roughly halfway between, I believe, Guantanamo Bay and Santiago, right. which was their ultimate objective. And then they set out on two parallel roads. Right. Yeah, the, the infantry gets the good road, um, which is an actual road, whereas the cavalry has to climb up a hill and, and mm. sort of make their own trail. Um, so the, the cavalry couldn't simply couldn't advance as quickly as the infantry down on the road, which was a, a disadvantage to them. Mm. You killed some of my men! These are insurrectos! And I'm an American! Make it fight, I can't take it back. We're all going to the same place. Let's go there together. Sam Elliott knows how to deliver a line. <laughs> Here's 25 years still later, still riding a horse and doing it well. <laughs> right. Maybe while we're reflecting on that, you can uh, indulge us with your fun Sam Elliott story that you uh, imparted from your previous episode when you first met him. Well, when I was on the, on the set of Gettysburg, I had just arrived and feeling very much out of place. And they had lunch out in the middle of the field. It was a stubble cornfield. They had a tent pitched. And uh, Ron Maxwell told me, go get some lunch. So I got a tray and I'm standing there and I'm loading up with food. And I turn around with my full tray of food and almost knock down General Buford in full General Buford uniform and the dirt on his face and everything else. And I almost wiped him out. And uh, I felt terrible, and he, he was very kind. He, he didn't, didn't cuss me out or anything. But, um, but so that was my introduction to Sam Elliott. Not many people can claim to almost knocking out Sam Elliott. <laughs> well, okay. Except unless you're in Roadhouse. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Where's my saber, man? Theodore! I'm afraid I've left it. So did Roosevelt actually carry a saber into the jungle? No, there was a, a big stink early on before they ever got to combat that the, the um, War Department wanted the Rough Riders to practice the art of the saber mm. and to learn how to sword fight. And of course, Roosevelt and, and Leonard Wood thought that was ridiculous <laughs> and wanted nothing to do with that. And they were, I mean, literally joking that, you know, well, what are we supposed to do with these things? Hack our way through the jungle. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, is the government not aware that the Spaniards have rifles? Mm. And, you know, we're probably not going to be doing a lot of sword fighting. So they they really didn't, uh, mm. they, they got away from that. <laughs> For those of you interested in learning more about the Buffalo Soldiers in this campaign, there's a really good first-hand account written by one of its members by the name of Horace Bivens. Uh, he wrote a, a really excellent eyewitness testimony as to the campaign in Cuba. So if you're looking for something a, a little bit different, that's some good primary source mm -hmm. material. Yeah. The Rough Riders have turned the right flank. Hallelujah! Yes, sir. Hot! Damn. Willer's really depicted it's this uh, sort of wild hellion. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> it, it's, it's a little cartoonish. <laughs> and uh, I don't think that Wheeler got close enough to the enemy to be firing his pistol at anybody. Um, uh, but it, it's Hollywood, you know, you just accept what it is. He dead. And, uh... I believe about over 30, sorry, over 30 wounded. I do like this scene because it, it's truly the first scene in the movie where he lacks the energy, he lacks the spunk. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and he's had in every scene prior to all this. I, and I think to your point exactly. Mm-hmm. Our boys at dawn face the gleaming helmets and flashing bayonets oh, and no say gleaming helmets, Willie. We're in the jungle. Oh, shut up, Freddy. Just do your part in paint. But it's not true. Truth is the first casualty of war, and you should know that. Although the subplot with William Randolph Hearst is greatly exaggerated, there's some great one-liners here (laughs) that that, that speak to some (laughs) truths of the hour uh, and of the time period. Hearst did go to Cuba for a bit during the war, Mm -hmm. but he was not present during this particular no, and, campaign. And, but I mean, to give credit to the film, I mean, had he been there, I'm sure he would have said stuff just like that. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> True in spirit. What's your name, Trooper? Wadsworth. Frank. The Wadsworth. Fun side point, this Wadsworth is the grandson of the General Wadsworth who fights mm-hmm. here at Gettysburg and is later killed during the Battle of the Wilderness. So that the family lineage and upholding that sense of family honor is an important thing for a lot of these folks. Right. Whoa, whoa, I'm going to eat in the dark, so I can't see what I'm eating. <laughs> By George, I love that old gentleman. He's a regular Gamecock. <laughs> Theodore, get off your back. I have some mixed feelings about uh, <laughs> Roosevelt falling in laughter over the corpse of one of his men. It did take an emotional toll on him. At the same time, after the first battle, a lot of his men, the mood was lifted because they it was an icebreaker. They had just right. survived a thing. What, what are your thoughts? Then? Well, that's it. They survived. They won. They yeah. won the day. They pushed the Spanish back. Um, so the, for, for first blood, I mean, it was a successful thing, but they lost people and mm-hmm. people were killed. Uh, people were wounded. And um, it, it, that's the reality, is that you know, war is not just all about glory, it's also about death. Mm-hmm. And you know, yeah, I'm, I'm with you about Roosevelt falling over the body of his men. Mm-hmm. I think that's a little, it's a little over the top. Mm-hmm. And again, it's Hollywood. So they betray uh, General Shafter, the commanding general of the American army, as, as, as very obese. Uh, he was. He weighed over 300 pounds. Uh, they show the, putting him on a horse. He didn't ride a horse uh, until much later in the fight. They put him in the back of a wagon, and they said they had to find the strongest mule in the U.S. Army to drag him up the hills um, in, in order to get him out to where his troops mm-hmm. were, because he spent most of his time on the beach because he simply couldn't move. Mm-hmm. And people like Joe Wheeler thought he was ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And they thought, well, why are we listening to this guy as our commander when he can't even, you know, can't even get around? If I recall, Roosevelt called him a gross negligence and oh yeah yeah and he was suffering from gout and mm-hmm. he essentially had his command post in his tent right and he was uh, completely detached Roosevelt I think said you know, the guy never got within more than two or three miles of the front <laughs> uh, all that said he too was a Medal of Honor recipient. Yeah, yeah going back to the Civil, the Civil War. Civil War. Right. But this is a guy who's past his prime. Yes, definitely. Yeah. I want to find me a fine whore, a real pretty one. Someone that's, that's so good at what she does that it can make me think that she loves me. I think uh, Roosevelt's uh, uncomfortable reaction to this is <laughs> very true. <laughs> not, not the sort of type to discuss things like that in public. Right. You're the closest thing to a father I ever know. I sure as hell won't let you do. How true do you think these emotions are? It's tough. Um, I mean, he was a very, Roosevelt was a very introspective man. I mean, he certainly would be feeling a lot of what the these sort of uh, little monologues are, uh, that are going on. Um, but uh, some, again, it, 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 because we're watching it on film, it has to be sound. So it has to be voices, it has to be dialogue. Um, that's very, I mean, I'm very fortunate in what I do when I'm creating internal dialogue because on the written page you can get away with that. You can't do that in a movie. Um, so I think they have to put it all out there. And if, some of it's a little overdone, of course, but some of it probably is spot on. Perhaps 
Perhaps you can set the stage for us a little bit in the build up to the battles for Kettle Hill and San Juan Hill. Well, how are all the pieces falling into place? Well, the entire army, I mean, you're talking 16,000 men are involved. What uh, General Shafter orders them to do, first of all, is orders the entire army to march down one road. Um, it's a muddy mess and you can't put 16,000 people on one road and expect them to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. So that's the first mistake they make. But then Roosevelt is ordered by Leonard Wood to take his people to cross a creek and move out to the right and just sit and wait. Uh, until the rest of the army comes up and gets into position in different, and there are troops on Roosevelt's right, there are troops behind him, uh, tr troops right in front of him, the Buffalo soldiers, and then troops, the regular infantry is off to the left on the larger hill. So they're, they're pu putting themselves into position um, right under the guns of the Spaniards. I mean, the Spaniards are watching this, and, and the Spaniards have artillery. And they're making, they begin to make good use of that artillery where the Americans have, uh, again, the unfortunate thing where their artillery is smoke, use black powder, which creates an enormous amount of smoke. So when an American cannon fires, the whole Spanish army knows where it is. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, a deadly problem. Um, whereas the Spanish, again, have smokeless powder. So this, that's the, the setup for this. Um, as the soldiers are getting ready, It's interesting, they, they just showed a blue crab. Um, what was all over Cuba were land crabs. These things were bigger than your hand, mm. and they would particularly, if there was a dead body, the land crabs would swarm over these bodies, and it was a pretty, pretty grotesque mm. thing. Um, but what they just showed there was a blue crab, and that, <laughs> not the same thing. <laughs> so we can get into scientific and biological matters here on Real History as well. Got the yellow jack. And I don't care what nobody say. We all gonna get it. The ugliness of this aid station, though, I think is quite true. Everything is so incredibly grimy. Mm -hmm. You can almost smell what this scene uh, right. might have been like. And, of course, up until World War I, illness, disease, was the number one killer mm -hmm. in all of our American wars. And certainly with malaria, yellow fever and whatnot, lack of good drinking water, it just eviscerates some of the right. race of these men. Yeah. Uh, well, if you got a wound, mm -hmm. chances are you might, it, it would get worse uh, almost immediately uh, because of everything besides the wound, um, everything around you. And, and, and the, the casualty rate was enormous for anyone um, you know, who, who might have gotten a, a, a minor, even a minor wound, um, and you'd pay a serious price for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Also further to the north, there's an equally pivotal battle at El Cane, right. which General Shafter thought might take two or three hours, and it ends up taking the whole day to secure that position. Right. And so he himself lamented, I may have initiated too much at once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a true understatement. Yeah. Uh, and so his forces are really scattered, and it, it really leads to a lot of pell-mell assaults. Yes. Runner! My compliments to Captain Grimes, and he may commence his preparatory fires. Yes, sir. And it's worth noting here that in addition to acting, Dale Dye also served as technical advisor uh, on a lot of this, as he does for a lot of war movies. Mm -hmm. They'll turn the flank of these heights, and we'll conduct a frontal assault. I assure you, sir, that our regiment shall not embarrass... Your regiment, Theodore. Your regiment. I'm glad they make the point here that if you see the one star on Wood's shoulder, he gets promoted in the field and command of an entire brigade, uh, which includes the Rough Riders and then and other brigades, uh, other regiments as well. Um, and it, Roosevelt is therefore elevated to command of the first volunteer cavalry, the Rough Riders. All this was filmed on a big ranch in Texas. I would think uh, the real environment's probably a little bit more lush, <laughs> probably a little <laughs> bit more green. Yeah, definitely. But yeah. Uh, you have to work with what you have. Right. Oh, opening casualties, Lieutenant. A dozen or more, sir, maybe more. Saddler Sergeant, get little Texas out of here. So Roosevelt's horse's name was in fact named Texas. A little, yeah, yeah. A little Texas. 
But unfortunately, his other horse drowned at Daiquiri. Why right, were they were unloading the boats? Because yeah. they didn't have ramps or boats from her. They were just no. pushing the horses and mules into the water. Letting them swim to shore. And uh, mm -hmm. however many got to shore, got to shore. So right. uh, certainly not the most humane <laughs> treatment of animals here in the Army. Hey, what are you doing? Leave him be. He's dead. What's it to you? It's my compadre. Unfortunately, the... Uh, the actor playing Nash, Brad Johnson. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, he passed away from COVID during the pandemic. Really? A relatively young man. Huh. So uh, sad to see him lingering here like this, uh, mm -hmm. knowing of his more recent real life outcome. <laughs> Ain't it funny how when a grown up man, when he died, how he cried for his wife and his mama. It don't matter how brave he is or what he done. Seen his conversation with uh, the character of the Buffalo Soldier. It's worth pointing out that TNT also made a movie about the Buffalo Soldiers <laughs> in the late 1990s as mm -hmm. well. That one starred uh, Danny Glover. So right. they were just churning them out at TNT here. Right. Well, it was Ted. Time. It was Ted Turner. I mean, yeah. it, was, it was on the strength of what Turner wanted to do at the time. Yep. And if we don't attack, nobody's going to be left here to make an attack. Is that clear? Yes, sir. No one to make an attack. Yes, sir. I got it. I recall there is an instance or two where Roosevelt writes about a man standing right next to him mm -hmm. being killed and the, the, the sound of it, the, the, the surreal experience of that it was something that never left him. Right, yeah, there, it happens actually when Roosevelt starts up the hill. Mm. Uh, there's a soldier who's hunkered down in the grass and won't get up. He's afraid. Mm -hmm. And Roosevelt's talking to him and trying to convince him to get up. The fellow finally stands up and gets immediately, mm -hmm. takes a bullet. Mm -hmm. Oh, baby! And I, I do love the incorporation of uh, Frederick Remington <laughs> painting away here on canvas. And sure enough, I think his painting served as a huge point of visual reference for the filmmakers here. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they were trying to recreate many of his images. Right. Hey, man, where's the cavalry at? How should I know? I'm a non-combatant, damn it. I do have a problem with this whole scene with the, you know, the guy, the wounded guy going back up to the front lines. First of all, the hospital would have been a good mile or more behind where all of this is taking place. Um, so well out of range of fire. And uh, in fact, some of there were hospitals all the way back down on the beach, mm. um, which, you know, miles away. So it's, it's a little improbable that somebody would have been able to hobble their way right up to the front lines. But we don't have this personal story of redemption then if well, he doesn't true. do that. That's yeah, true. We need, I, a, we, we need our feel-good moment. I'm just, being, I'm just being a cynic. That, that's all I... <laughs> troop He's calling out for G-Troop, but I, I think... Uh, <laughs> I think O'Neill was in charge of A, a troops. A so troop. yeah, little quibbles. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've got quite a few little, a, a few little quibbles with all of this. Oh, feel free to <laughs> unleash. You still run on that leg? I can run up that hill. Welcome back, Henry. Welcome back, old man. Well, one thing that's been bothering me through the whole film, and it's not going to change for the rest of the film, according to Roosevelt himself, when he crosses Spanish trenches where, and this is later in the film, when, when they find me, when they reach the, the high ground uh, and there are dead Spaniards in the trenches, they're wearing blue uniforms. The Spanish uniforms were blue, not this whatever this is that they're, you know, made up to, to look like. Again, it's a, it's a silly nitpick. Um, and you have to differentiate when you're looking at the film, you have yeah. to see the difference between the American soldiers and the Spanish soldiers, or it's a, or it's a confusing mess. Mm -hmm. So they have to, you know, dress them accordingly. Mm -hmm. Our viewers love nitpicks, so keep them coming. <laughs> Nash! No! So it, it's here where O'Neill does in fact meet his end, though as is often the case with war movies, uh, everybody's usually a lot older than the people who they are portraying. <laughs> yes. Um, Sam, I would get 15 years mm -hmm. older than O'Neill. When you look at photos of O'Neill, he's a very young, black-haired, robust, athletic guy. There is one other nitpick 
thing that Roosevelt was in fact on his horse mm. the whole time. Everything that's going on that you're seeing right here, he was on horseback. And he has a, a, a groom or a, a, an aide who handles the horse named Bardshar. Mm. And then Bardshar, you know, is right there. I mean, he's, he's like a ter terrific, uh, loyal uh, servant, if you will. Um, and he's a soldier. But uh, Roosevelt is on horseback during all of this action that you see. Makes it all the more miraculous that he wasn't hit. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Also, I mean, in the description of the land, there was extremely tall grass and a lot of it mm -hmm. um, on both sides of the creek. And that's what the men were hunkered down in and, mm -hmm. and sought cover in, um, which protected them enormously. I mean, so it, it wasn't quite like pictured here where they're all on, in, in the wide open. <laughs> And the big push-off here is what Roosevelt famously calls his crowded hour. Yes. <laughs> now, your earlier point, there's uh, not much tall grass that they're no. wading through here. And they're not really going up much of a hill. <laughs> <laughs> One of the other things, though, too, uh, eyewitnesses at the bottom of the hill were saying that it wasn't these big columns that we see either mm -hmm. in the Frederick Remington paintings or in movie depictions like this. It was like this, uh, almost like this slithering, slowly moving snake just kind of right. oozing its way up the hillside. Little clusters of men here and there who would leapfrog. Um, and so it's uh, not done in such a dramatic fashion, perhaps, as uh, we see here with the big vista. What they don't show here is why Roosevelt dismounts, is his horse takes him right up to a barbed wire fence, and he knows the horse is exhausted and he's not going to try to jump the fence, mm -hmm. so he lets the horse go, pats him in the rear end and says, and well, what he says is, I'll probably never see you again. And uh, he does, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's so that from that point on, Roosevelt is on foot. You heard him, Tim. You wait for the war to come to you. Well, let's take it to them. Move out. And what a lot of people don't realize, and how the battle's remembered, we think of it as the Battle of San Juan Hill, but it's actually the story of two hills that are right. side by side. Exactly. And in this opening part, we see the attack on Kettle Hill, and then it shifts back to the even bigger hill. Which right. is it's, it's called Kettle Hill because there's a huge bronze or brass kettle up on top of the hill. It's a sugar plantation. Mm -hmm. And uh, they use the, you know, the, they melt the, whatever they do, however they make sugar, I don't know. Uh, but they use this kettle for that reason. So the, it was one of the generals, uh, Roosevelt asks, you know, what do we call this place? He wants to know to remember it. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, there's a kettle, let's call it Kettle Hill. That's how it gets the name. But San Juan hill is the next hill over is the next is a bigger hill the infantry has been fighting like crazy mm -hmm. trying to get up that hill all the while Roosevelt is doing this on Kettle Hill and I also have to point out Roosevelt doesn't have a rifle mm -hmm. you know he the only weapon he has at his disposal is a pistol uh, which he puts to, to good use, mm -hmm. um, but it, it, you know, it, the, all the way through this, they've shown Roosevelt with a rifle. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware he ever had a rifle. So the legend goes, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the pistol that he was using was recovered from the battleship Maine. From the Maine. It was yeah. restored, yeah, and, and rejuvenated and given, given to him as a gift, and he uses it. Uh, he uh, inflicts his share of retribution accordingly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Now here are the, the aforementioned Gatling guns. <laughs> and as you said, Roosevelt hears the staccato sound in the background, right. as do his men, and they realize, ah, it's the Gatlings. Right. 
and I, the sound of that, if I recall, it, it really gives them a boost of energy when yeah. they need it. It breaks the stalemate pretty mm. much on the big hill where the infantry is fighting. Uh, it, it, they've bogged down. I mean, it's a tough fight. And the Spanish have all the good ground, all the high ground. And uh, when the Gatling guns, I, I think the Gatling guns uh, affect Spanish morale as mm -hmm. much as they affect American morale. Great point. Who knows how to work it? Yeah. He does. Nick Sheezen, Nick Sheezen, comrade. Well, Don't touch him, I need the hun. Bring him over here. So were there German advisors here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've, we've discovered something new. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Back in the English. Nein, Herr Obers. Die Wörtmann, diese Waffe. I can see den Gertmann direkt in the side einen. I can see it feet from the right. Put it through, Indian Bob. There's a, a great deal of license in these scenes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Roosevelt gets to demonstrate his bilingual abilities this yes, way. Right. He did speak ragged French. Um, I'm not sure about the German. <laughs> he who his blood with me shall be my brother. Gentlemen in England, line of bed, shall think themselves a curse. They were not here. <laughs> a good heavy dose of Shakespeare here to <laughs> add on top. Yeah, that, that is the first thing people think of when they're under fire, or, you know, dishing out fire to the enemy is a, a Shakespearean verse comes to mind. <laughs> so. What? Where is everyone? Tiffany! So they get part of this correct as he's descending down the hill and right. shifting on where and nobody and nobody follows him. Right. And <laughs> five men initially go down with him, right. three of them, I think, get yeah, shot. Right. And Either he didn't give the order, or it got lost amidst all the volume. Well, he maintains um, he gave the order, but uh, nobody heard him. Uh -huh. With all of the ruckus of battle yeah. going on, and so he goes back up the hill, and he's he's not he's not happy. Yeah, I, <laughs> he tells him, "Hey, yeah, excuse me, yeah. is they, anybody they, gonna follow me?" <laughs> they got that little part right. Yeah. <laughs> I can see the flags waving like freedom. Bit of melodrama, yes. Just a little bit. Don't mess with Blackjack. <laughs> no. <laughs> do tell. <laughs> I'm sorry. He, he, didn't, he didn't do acrobatics? No. no. <laughs> so he, he does... He kills he, one man with his pistol. Right. He misses the other. There were two and uh -huh. jumped up. He misses one, then he aims carefully and nails the other one. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I mean, it, and he he absorbs that moment. I mean, it, it yeah. it's a profound thing. He knows he's done, and uh, you know he's killed a man, and he doesn't just run off and start killing other men. I mean, he takes that very very seriously. It's all right, Colonel. It's all right. It'll never be the same. It's a rather prophetic line because. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Certainly wouldn't be the same for him. Right. This is his moment. <laughs> yeah, but I like to say that you know people need to understand when they're reading about Teddy Roosevelt, this is not his only moment. Mm. And that's what's yes. so profound about his story is he has lots of moments it's like very this. Very true. I mean, his life is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And what happened to him? Hit through the spine. Paralyzed, I'm afraid. I'm sorry for your misfortune, Marshal. Take him to the beach, to my yacht. Notify my surgeons immediately. Marshall does, in fact, survive. He loses a leg and he's uh, paralyzed for the rest of his life. But he actually goes on to write a book about the Rough Riders. Hmm. And uh, he outlives most of the characters in this movie. He dies in 1933. Hmm. I don't think they could have done a better job at casting Roosevelt. I mean, you look at yeah. you look at Berenger in this scene. He's just the spitting image yeah, it, of be, Roosevelt. It, it's it's tempting if you're an actor, if you're a real ham actor, which Berenger is not, um, to take it over the top because Roosevelt is that kind of a character that you can be shouting, you know, at the top of your lungs, bully everywhere you go, and <laughs> and flash your teeth and all that stuff because that's that's uh, the, the cartoon image of Roosevelt, and it would be tempting for a lot of lesser actors mm. to 
to play him that way. And I'm glad, yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm glad to see that they didn't play him that way. Mr. Crane, would you be so kind with your camera to take a photograph of our regiment on this glorious hill? Perhaps you can speak to the affection that Roosevelt had for his men and how that was mutually felt throughout the rest of his life. Yeah, I mean, the, the men that, that flocked to his command in the first place loved him, and they'd never served under him. Yeah. Um, and so once they've served under him and done what they did, um, historically, uh, I mean, yeah, he, he's an icon above just about anyone of that era. Um, it's hard to imagine anyone who is more popular than he is, mm -hmm. um, not just with soldiers, but then, of course, that expands into the, everybody, the, the citizenry. Mm -hmm. I like the recreation of the famous photograph of right. them as well. Right. Although this necessarily wasn't the end of combat, San Juan Hill, because they maintained that position for about another two weeks and they were constantly harassed by fire. Well, there was, fire a, but it was harassment. It wasn't yeah, significant true. combat. I mean, the, the Spanish attempted one advance on the American position on top of the hill that fizzled out pretty quickly. Yeah. And uh, most of that, the time, it was sharpshooters. You right. had to be careful sniper fire. Uh, but, but then for the most part, once the American Navy, because uh, they had already blockaded the, the harbor below, um, once they engaged the Spanish Navy in, in the harbor, they decimated the mm -hmm. Spanish Navy, and that was the end of it. I mean, yep. once the Spanish knew they had no, no support, that was really the end of the fight. Mm -hmm. And John Hay played by uh, Drill Sergeant Hartman in this movie, <laughs> uh, called it a splendid little war. Yeah, right. Right. And it was America's first intervention, in a way, in the age of imperialism, and there was no turning back. It was going to be the American century. Exactly. And this was going to help determine that. Yes, definitely. I do like these little homecoming vignettes at the end because like all wars, it shows us that not every veteran comes home to a flag-waving parade, that there's right. uncertainty, there's questions that linger, there are challenges that will be confronted. Uh, and this movie shows... It's, it sort of skips a step because when the when Rough Riders do arrive on ship uh, in Long Island, New York, uh, is where they're they're mm -hmm. brought back and they're quarantined because they're right. afraid of yellow fever right. and all of that. And they spend a couple of weeks uh, on the, on the island in New York at, at, a, at a readily built camp at a camp mm -hmm. that was made to house thousands of people. Yeah. And um, then it, it was a, a homecoming. I mean, there were thousands of right. people greeting them and people waving flags and toasting them and so forth. But then this takes it to the next step, you know, the, the next step beyond that, when it's time for each individual soldier to find what life he's going to lead mm -hmm. and, and how he's going to you know what he's going to go back home to this is supposed to be Sagmore Hill or some <laughs> variation thereof. <laughs> some variation thereof So as we see his children here, all of his sons later serve in uniform. Right. They all die in war in one way or another. Well, they, I mean, particularly um, uh, Quentin, obviously, yeah. in World War I, is shot down uh, over France and, and dies at the hands of the Germans. Uh, which is really the beginning of the end, which is how actually, if I, if I may say, it's how my book begins mm -hmm. uh, with sort of the beginning of the end for Roosevelt late in his life. It's a terrible, terrible blow. Well, I haven't seen you boys since the First World War ended. So if this were 22 years later, it would be in 1920, right. which would mean that Roosevelt's already dead. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, and Nash died in 1903, and so he's even longer gone. It's and, license. You know, yeah. you know the word. It's yeah. called license. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and O'Neill is buried in Arlington National Cemetery, not out here that in the, I did the not prairie. Know, but no, okay. So uh, 
this last scene really jumps the tracks mm -hmm. in regard to historical <laughs> reality. Sorry to be a downer there at the very end of the movie. <laughs> so Jeff, what are, your, what are your, some of your concluding thoughts on this movie? What are its strengths and weaknesses? Well, the strength is that it, it portrays Roosevelt with all the character that you would hope to see. Mm -hmm. um, it, without going into cartoon land, because it's too easy to do. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, there are nitpicky things. You know, there are limits when you're making a film with budget or where you're shooting, where you're filming, what the countryside looks like, um, you know, what you have to work with. And certainly they had limitations here, and so there are inaccuracies in, you know, the way the battles take place and the, the, the scenery is wrong. but. You know, given that, uh, given what they had to work with, I thought they did a pretty fine job. Um, I mean, there are the little historical things that you can pick at, and it's fun to do that, I suppose. <laughs> but I, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to trash the film because it's not worthy of that. It, it, it's it's mm -hmm. a better film than that. Um, and it, you know, I, I hope people see the film for what it is, and it, it's an exploration of the character of Teddy Roosevelt, mm -hmm. and he has a lot of character, and this is one chapter of his life. I mean, this is a three-hour movie that, you know, we've just explored one small chapter of his life, and it is a small chapter. Um, I've just written a book that covers the rest of it. Um, and I mean, there's a lot to cover, and so this is an extraordinary human being, an extraordinary American, and he's a lot of fun to write, and a very entertaining character, and I think you get some of that, you get enough of that from this film to make it worthwhile. Well put. So please do tell us a little bit more about your book and uh, <laughs> no, I, I, where people can get it. I, I wasn't I wasn't setting up to tout the book, but I'll so, do it for you now that you, now that you brought it up. Um, so no, it's uh, the old lion. It comes out on May sixteenth. It'll be everywhere. Uh, Amazon. You can go to my website and get an autographed copy. Um, it, it'll it'll be all over the country. And it's the story that Roosevelt. I would think Roosevelt would have told himself late in his life, reflecting back on the high points of his life from his childhood to his time in the, in the Dakotas as a cattle rancher, uh, to San Juan Hill and the Spanish-American War, to his time as president, uh, and then his time at the Amazon, uh, an expedition he takes late in his life to the Amazon River mm -hmm. that nearly kills him. Mm -hmm. He has no business going down there with the kind of physical shape he's in, and it's an, an extraordinary story. And you know the way he ends his life. Um, it, it's a it, it's an emotional story. It certainly was to me writing it um, because I learned to love the character. Anytime I'm doing a book like this. I have to get inside the heads of the character to speak for them. Uh, I'm putting words in the mouths of significant historical characters, and I had better believe that they're the right words. Because uh, if I don't believe it, you won't believe it, and the book just won't work. So, you know, getting in to know Teddy Roosevelt in as intimate a way as I could. Um, I love the man. I love the character. And then writing the end of his life was tough. Mm. Um, I mean, it was an extremely emotional book. And, there, and there's some things that happen throughout the story that are uh, extremely emotional as well. Anyway, I, I'm, I'm very proud of this book. Maybe, maybe that shows. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that the book does well, and I'm hoping people read it and get the same thing out of it that I got out of it writing it, is that this is a remarkable human being whose story needs to be told. Wonderful. I'm really looking forward to reading it. Thank you. So, Jeff, thank you so much for having us in your awesome man cave to watch <laughs> Rough Riders, flanked appropriately enough by two bull moose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, with all that being said, thanks for tuning into this episode of Real History. Until we see you next time, stay curious.